Ibicus, Greek, Ibikos FL, second half of 6th century BC was an ancient Greek lyric poet, a citizen of Regium in Magna Graecia, probably active at Samos during the reign of the tyrant Polycrates and numbered by the scholars of Hellenistic Alexandria in the canonical list of nine lyric poets. He was mainly remembered in antiquity for pederastic verses, but he also composed lyrical narratives on mythological themes in the manner of Stesichorus. His work survives today only as quotations by ancient scholars or recorded on fragments of papyrus recovered from archaeological sites in Egypt, yet his extant verses include what are considered some of the finest examples of Greek poetry. The following lines, dedicated to a lover, Euryalus, were recorded by Athenaeus as a famous example of amorous praise. Euryal glaucon chariton thalos horon calicomon melodima se men kypris hartau. Agonoblepharos pay though rhodioisen and threpsen the rich language of these lines, in particular the accumulation of epithets, typical of Ibicus, is shown in the following translation Euryalus, offshoot of the blue-eyed graces, darling of the lovely-haired seasons, the Cyprian and soft-lidded persuasion nursed you among rose blossoms, this mythological account of his lover recalls Hesiod's account of Pandora, who was decked out by the same goddesses the graces, the seasons and persuasion so as to be a bane to mankind, an illusion consistent with Ibicus's view of love as unavoidable turmoil, as is the case with many other major poets of ancient Greece. Ibicus became famous not just for his poetry but also for events in his life, largely the stuff of legend. The testimonia are difficult to interpret, and very few biographical facts are actually known. <laughs> life The Byzantine Encyclopedia Suda represents a good example of a problematic biography, here translated by David Campbell Ibicus, son of Fishus, but some say son of the historian Polyslus of Messana, others son of Surtas, of Regium by birth. From there he went to Samos when it was ruled by the father of the tyrant Polycrates. This was in the time of Croesus, in the 54th Olympiad 564-60 BC. He was completely crazed with love for boys, and he was the inventor of the so-called sambike, a kind of triangular sathara. His works are in seven books in the Doric dialect. Captured by bandits in a deserted place he declared that the cranes which happened to be flying overhead would be his avengers. He was murdered, but afterwards one of the bandits saw some cranes in the city and exclaimed, Look, the avengers of Ibicus! Someone overheard and followed up his words, the crime was confessed and the bandits paid the penalty, whence the proverbial expression, the cranes of Ibicus. Suda's chronology has been dismissed as muddled, since it makes Ibicus about a generation older than Anacreon, another poet known to have flourished at the court of Polycrates, and it is inconsistent with what we know of the Samian tyrant from Herodotus. Eusebius recorded the poet's first experience of fame, Agnosichur. Somewhere between 542 and 537 BC and this better fits the period of Polycrates' reign. Suda's account seems to be corroborated by a papyrus fragment p. Oxy. usually ascribed to Ibicus, glorifying a youthful Polycrates, but this was unlikely to have been the Polycrates of Samos and might instead have been his son, mentioned in a different context by Himerius as Polycrates, governor of Rhodes. Suda's list of fathers of Ibicus also presents problems. There were no historians in the early 6th century, and Surtas looks like an invention of the comic stage, it has low associations. There was a Pythagorean lawgiver of Regium known as Fishus, but the early 6th century is too early for this candidate also. Ibicus gives no indication of being a Pythagorean himself, except in one poem he identifies the morning star with the evening star, an identity first popularized by Pythagoras. Suda's extraordinary account of the poet's death is found in other sources, such as Plutarch and Antipater of Sidon and later it inspired Friedrich Schiller to write a ballad called, The Cranes of Ibicus, yet the legend might be derived merely from a play upon the poet's name and the Greek word for the bird Ibix or Ibyx. It might even have been told of somebody else originally. Another proverb associated with Ibicus was recorded by Diogenianus, more antiquated than Ibicus, or more silly than Ibicus. The proverb was apparently based on an anecdote about Ibicus stupidly or nobly turning down an opportunity to become tyrant of Regium in order to pursue a poetic career instead. One modern scholar, however, infers from his poetry that Ibicus was in fact wise enough to avoid the lure of supreme power, citing as an example Plato's quotation from one of his lyrics, 
I am afraid it may be in exchange for some sin before the gods that I get honor from men." There is no other information about Ibicus' activities in the West, apart from an account by Himerius, that he fell from his chariot while traveling between Katana and Hymera and injured his hand badly enough to give up playing the lyre. For some considerable time, some modern scholars have found in the surviving poetry evidence that Ibicus might have spent time at Sicyon before journeying to Samos. Mythological references indicate local knowledge of Sicyon and could even point to the town's alliance with Sparta against Argos and Athens. His depiction of the women of Sparta as thigh showing, quoted by Plutarch as proof of Lax morals among the women there, is vivid enough to suggest that he might have composed some verses in Sparta also. It is possible that he left Samos at the same time as Anacreon, on the death of Polycrates, and there is an anonymous poem in the Palatine Anthology celebrating Regium as his final resting place, describing a tomb located under an elm, covered in ivy and white reeds. Poetry <inaudible> 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 Ibicus' role in the development of Greek lyric poetry was as a mediator between Eastern and Western styles. Sappho and Alcaeus wrote while Stesichorus was developing the different art of the choral ode in the West. They owed nothing to him, and he owed nothing to them. But soon afterwards the art of the West was brought to Ionia, and the fusion of the two styles marked a new stage in Greek poetry. For Stesichorus left a disciple, who began by writing in the master's manner and then turned to other purposes and made his poetry the vehicle for his own private, or public, emotions. Cecil Maurice Bauer Although scholars like Bauer have concluded that his style must have changed with his setting, such a neat distinction is actually hard to prove from the existing verses, which are an intricate blend of the public choral style of Stesichorus, and the private soloist style of the lesbian poets. It is not certain that he ever in fact composed monody lyrics for solo performance, but the emotional and erotic quality of his verse, and the fact that his colleague in Samos was Anacreon, who did compose monody, suggest that Ibicus did too. On the other hand, some modern scholars believe that choral lyrics were actually performed by soloists and therefore maybe all Ibicus' work was monody. He modeled his work on the choral Lyrics of Stesichorus at least in so far as he wrote narratives on mythical themes often with original variations from the traditional stories and structured his verses in triads units of three stanzas each, called strophe, antistrophe, and epode, so closely in fact that even the ancients sometimes had difficulty distinguishing between the two poets whereas however ancient scholars collected the work of Stesichorus into 26 books, each probably a self-contained narrative that gave its title to the whole book, they compiled only seven books for Ibicus, which were numbered rather than titled and whose selection criteria are unknown. Recent papyrus finds suggest also that Ibicus might have been the first to compose choral victory odes, an innovation usually credited to Simonides. Until the 1920s, all that survived of Ibicus' work were two large ish fragments, one seven, the other thirteen lines long, and about fifty other lines scraped together from a variety of ancient commentaries. Since then, papyrus finds have greatly added to the store of Ibycian verses, notably, and controversially, 48 continuous lines addressed to Polycrates, whose identification with Polycrates of Rhodes son of Polycrates, the Samian tyrant requires a careful selection of historical sources. Authorship of the poem is attributed to Ibicus on textual and historical grounds but its quality as verse is open to debate. Insipid, inept and slovenly, or, more gently, not an unqualified success, and optimally, the work of a poet realizing a new vision, with a great command of epic material which he could manipulate for encomiastic effect. In the poem, Ibikos parades the names and characteristics of heroes familiar from Homer's Trojan epic, as types of people the poem is not about, until he reaches the final stanza, where he reveals that his real subject is Polycrates, whom he says he will immortalize in verse. An elaborate and not very amusing joke, this puzzling poem has been considered historically significant by some scholars as a signal from Ibicus that he is now turning his back on epic themes to concentrate on love poetry instead, a new vision or recusatio, he composed like Stesichorus in a literary language, largely epic with some Doric flavoring, and with a few eolisms that he borrowed from the love poetry of Sappho and Alcaeus. 
It is possible however that the Doric dialect was added by editors in Hellenistic and Roman times, when the poet's hometown, Regium, had become more Doric than it had been in the poet's own time. In addition to this, superficial element of Doric dialect, the style of Ibicus features mainly dactylic rhythms reflecting the epic traditions he shared with Stesichorus, a love theme and accumulated epithets. His use of imagery can seem chaotic but it is justified as an artistic effect. His style has been described by one modern scholar as graceful and passionate. The ancients sometimes considered his work with distaste as a lecherous and corrupting influence but they also responded sympathetically to the pathos he sought to evoke. His account of Menelaus's failure to kill Helen of Troy, under the spell of her beauty, was valued by ancient critics above Euripides's account of the same story in his play Andromache. Fragment 286 The following poem was quoted by the ancient scholar Athenaeus in his wide-ranging discourses Scholars at Dinner and it demonstrates some of the characteristics of Ibycian verse In spring the Kydonian Apple trees, watered by flowing Streams there where the maidens Have their unravished garden, and vine buds Growing under the shadowy branches of the vines, bloom and flourish. For me, however, love is at rest in no season, but like the Thracian north wind, ablaze with lightning, rushing from Aphrodite with scorching, fits of madness, dark and unrestrained, it forcibly convulses from their very roots. My mind and heart, the poem establishes a contrast between the tranquility of nature and the ever restless impulses to which the poet's desires subject him, while the images and epithets accumulate almost chaotically, communicating a sense of his inner turmoil. In the original Greek, initial tranquility is communicated by repeated vowel sounds in the first six lines. His love of nature and his ability to describe it in lively images are reminiscent of Sappho's work. Topic. Reception In Book 4 of Apollonius Rhodius's Argonautica, the goddess Hera reveals that Achilles is destined to marry Medea in the Elysian Fields Argonautica 4.811-15. A scholiast on the passage comments that this account was first put forward by Ibicus, and that it was also taken up by Simonides of CEOs. In another scholium, it is said that the Argonautica's account of Ganymede's abduction by an amorous Zeus Argonautica 3 was also modeled on a version by Ibicus in Homer's earlier account, Zeus abducted the youth to be his wine pourer, Iliad 20.234, and that Ibicus, moreover, described the abduction of Tithonus by dawn Aos. Apollonius Rhodius represented Eros as a child of Aphrodite Argonautica 3.25-6 and there is a relevant scholium on that passage too, according to which Sappho made Eros the son of Earth and Heaven, Simonides made him the son of Aphrodite and Ares, and Ibicus made him the son of... The section is lost, but it has been suggested that he made Eros the son of Aphrodite and Hephaestus... Notes <laughs>